Hello again all! Welcome back to the Knowledge Tower, where we investigate the science behind the Bionicle legend. In today's investigation, we continue with the second installment of our three-part series exploring the details of the Solis Magna star system. Back in part one, we took a closer look at whether Solis Magna was a one-star system, or if it was actually a binary, and how the view from the ground on Spherus Magna would be affected by this. If you didn't watch that investigation, I'd recommend checking it out before starting this video, as we will be using some pre-established terms and ideas from video 1 as we move forward. The link is in the card above and the description below. All caught up? Great, let's get into it. In this second video in the series, we will be taking a closer look at Solus A, the star in the binary around which Spherus Magna orbits. We know from our last investigation that it is one half of a binary system, however there is still a lot of unknowns about the star itself. What kind of star is it? What's its mass, its luminosity, where would its habitable zone lie? Is there a way of using what we know about the star from the Bionicle Canon to determine any of these features? There is a huge variation of stellar types within our universe after all, ranging from the tiniest white dwarfs to the largest blue supergiants from the extreme properties of neutron stars to relatively benign stars like our own sun. Can we really use what little information we have from the story to slim down that list? I think we can, but to get there, we have to do some digging and make the best inferences we can from what little information we have. Strangely enough, the main piece of canon we will explore will not actually be any of the scraps of descriptions of Solus Magna that we get, but instead will be the details of the mission of Matanui himself. When the great beings created Matanui, one of the key missions they gave him was the observation of alien cultures on other planets. We do not know how many different cultures that Matanui observed during his mission, however, given the near 100,000 year timescale over which it occurred, we can assume that even with hundreds or thousands of years of dedicated study for each culture, it would still allow for a large number of worlds to be visited overall. But one key piece of trivia from Greg Farshti is what really makes this relevant to our investigation and that is that the GSR never actually left the Solus Magna system. Greg has been adamant on this point across several different instances of being asked by the fans. The GSR cannot travel faster than light, and it never left the Solus Magna system in all of those thousands of years. What we can infer from this, in my opinion, is that unlike our own solar system with its one known habitable world, Solus Magna must be a star system that is teeming with life across many different planets. The fact that we've established that it is a binary system can help with this, with the GSR visiting Solus B without technically having left the overall Solus Magna system. But even with this addition, I think that when looking at what type of star Solus A could be, we need to primarily look for one that has a wide and stable habitable zone that can host a large number of planets. With that main objective in mind, I started my research. Immediately, I discounted the likes of white dwarfs and neutron stars, stellar remnants of former stars that would have likely destroyed any planets orbiting them through processes such as supernova explosions. I also discounted the larger, fast-burning stars like the blue supergiants, as their lifespans of only a few million years would not have allowed enough time for complex life to evolve upon any planets in their orbits, given the timescale of life on Earth as a baseline. That narrowed down the search considerably, and, after quite a bit of digging through various astrophysics papers, I found the perfect study for our needs. This paper by Kane et al. explores the sizes of the habitable zone of many different stellar types within the mass and lifespan range that could allow for life to form, and then investigates the stability of increasing numbers of Earth-sized planets within that zone. Ultimately, the paper determines how many approximately Earth-sized worlds can exist within the habitable zone of these stars while still maintaining a stable orbit. Now, that sounded to me like a fantastic paper to use for our purposes. The key results of this paper were visualised within this graph. The x-axis shows the mass of the studied star types in relation to the mass of our own Sun, ranging from less than 0.2 solar masses up to 1.2 solar masses. The y-axis shows the plotted stability or survival rate of the planets in the simulations that the team ran, 
with the survivability of the system being plotted logarithmically from 0% at the bottom to 100% at the top. The different lines on the graph represent the simulated planetary systems that the paper's team tested, plotting the percentage of simulations in which a five-planet system, a six-planet system, and a seven-planet system sustained stable orbits within the habitable zones of the simulated stars across the mass range of the study. This axis is also further divided into four areas, which represent the mass ranges of the four different star types that were selected for the study. First, up to 0.45 solar masses, there are the M-type stars, also known as red dwarfs. Next, there are the K-type, or orange dwarf stars, ranging from 0.45 to 0.8 solar masses. Then, there are the G-type, or yellow dwarf stars, a group that includes our own Sun, which range from 0.8 to 1.05 solar masses. Finally, there are the F-type, or yellow-white dwarf stars, at the end of the graph, going from 1.05 to 1.2 solar masses. The parts of the graph that are of interest to us are the areas where the lines reach up to that 100% stability mark at the top of the y-axis. These areas are where the 5, 6 and 7 planet systems were all stable during the simulations of the study. The line showing the 5 planet systems is the most stable, reaching that 100% mark in the low mass end of the red dwarf section of the graph and remaining there throughout. Six and seven planet systems have a lot more variability, though there are islands of stability in three key places on the graph. Two in the orange dwarf mass range here and here, and one in the yellow-white dwarf mass range here. Interestingly, this shows that yellow dwarf stars like our Sun are actually less suited for a larger number of worlds within their habitable zones, with the stability going way down for seven planet systems which, I must admit, I did not expect coming into this investigation. But we must go with the science, so we will add yellow dwarfs and red dwarfs into our discard pile and take a closer look at the two remaining options, the orange dwarfs and the yellow-white dwarfs. When it comes to differentiating between the two as to which is the more likely category for Solace A to fall into, the key factor to delve into is the lifespan of the star. Higher mass stars, like the yellow-white dwarfs, have a lot more hydrogen fuel within them, so you could argue that this should mean that they last longer than their lower mass counterparts, as they have more fuel to fuse. However, the higher pressures in their cores due to all that extra mass also causes them to fuse hydrogen into helium far more quickly than lower mass stars, leading to a shorter lifetime overall. While yellow dwarf stars like our Sun may be in their hydrogen fusing stage for around 10 billion years, yellow white dwarfs can go through that fuel in as little as 2 billion years. If Solace A were a yellow white dwarf, this puts a very hard limit on the time in which life had to evolve on the planets within the system. Using Earth as an example, life wouldn't have even gotten past the single celled stage if it only had 2 billion years within which to evolve a far cry from the vast complexity of life that we see on Spherus Magna. This then puts the yellow-white dwarfs firmly in the rejection pile for Solace A, leaving us with only one stellar type candidate left standing, orange dwarfs. Being a lower mass stellar type, orange dwarfs can last far longer than even our own sun, with the lifetimes ranging from 17 to 70 billion years depending on their mass, giving more than enough time for complex life to evolve on the planets orbiting them. They have other advantages for the evolution of life too, with them emitting a reduced amount of harmful UV radiation compared to other star types, and, while being a lower mass stellar type, their habitable zones are still far enough away from the star to avoid tidal locking of their planets, aiding in their habitability. So, there we are, taking our prerequisite of being able to host a large number of habitable worlds into account, then a K-type or orange dwarf type star is our best bet for Solace A. Let's take a closer look at this type of star to understand what this means for the Solus Magna system. Orange dwarfs are subdivided by astronomers into specific spectral types, as shown in this table. For ease of use, I'm going to assign Solace A the characteristics of one of these spectral types and use its characteristics in any calculations going forwards. Our two islands of stability in the orange dwarf mass range from the earlier graph line up with the mass values of the K7V and the K4V spectral types. 
We could assign Solace A to either of them, but in the end, I went with K4V. It is the more massive of the two, and so would allow for wider orbits within the habitable zone, leading to longer year lengths for the planets, which I felt was more suitable. A spectral type of K4V gives Solace A a mass of around 0.73 times that of our Sun. And now that we have a figure for the mass, we can work out all kinds of things, both here and in many future videos on this channel. For example, the habitable zone for Solace A can be worked out using this equation, and shows that the area around the star in which liquid water could exist on the surface of its planets extends from around 0.4 to 6.4 astronomical units. An astronomical unit, or AU, is the equivalent of the average distance of the Earth orbiting around the Sun, or around 150 million kilometers. That 0.4 to 6.4 AU range gives us plenty of room for our potential seven habitable planets within the system, as well as plenty more potentially habitable moons. Given that we know this distance range, we can also use this next equation to determine the range in the length of the year of these potential planets. Running the numbers, the planets at the innermost edge of the habitable zone would take around 118 Earth days to complete one orbit of Solace A, or around 79 Spherus Magnon days if using their 36 hours a day system. Planets at the outermost edge, however, would have years up to around 205 Earth days long, or around 137 Magnon days. Spherus Magna itself would lie somewhere within this range, and once we know where, we can find out even more. Not only the length of its year, but also things like how big Solus A would look in the sky, and how much of the incoming solar radiation at that distance would compare to that of the Sun and the Earth. But this video is already long enough, so those will have to wait for future investigations. So, after a load of maths, graphs and tables, let me leave you with one more before we finish. A results table showing all we have discovered so far about Solus A. Well, that's it for part two. In part three of this investigation, we will bring Solus B back into the equation, working out its own characteristics as well as how it interacts with the rest of the system. That's it for this month. I hope you found it interesting and that you will join me again soon for another Bionicle Science investigation here at the Knowledge Tower.